Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Arlene Foster is to resign as the leader of the DUP and as First Minister of Northern Ireland. It comes after more than 20 DUP Assembly members and four MPs signed a letter saying they have no confidence in her leadership. Emma Vardy reports on the implications for Northern Ireland and the future of the UK. Her report does contain some flash photography. In its 50-year history, Arlene Foster is only the third leader of the DUP, a party known for its hardline brand of unionism and staunch British identity, now at a rare crossroads. A short time ago, I called my party chairman to inform him that I intend to step down as leader of the Democratic Unionist Party. It has been the privilege of my life to serve the people of Northern Ireland as their first minister. Mrs Foster formed her political ideals growing up during the years of violence in Northern Ireland. The IRA tried to kill her father when she was a child and a bomb exploded under her school bus in Fermanagh in 1988. And I closed my eyes because I just didn't know what was going on and the Gillian fell on top of me sideways. As a law student, Arlene Foster joined the youth wing of the more moderate Ulster Unionists before defecting to the DUP. I believe that the Democratic Unionist Party is now the mainstream Unionist Party in Northern Ireland. She rose quickly through its ranks, becoming one of the party's most popular and unwavering politicians. When you think about bullying me, think again. Before replacing Peter Robinson to become First Minister in 2016. It meant working alongside Sinn Féin's Martin McGuinness, the former IRA commander who became Northern Ireland's deputy first minister. But their power-sharing partnership lasted just a year. He resigned over the DUP's handling of a green energy scheme, which wasted hundreds of millions of pounds of taxpayers' money. Where the much RHI scheme has um, brought us to this place uh, is a matter of deep regret for me. But Brexit became the party's biggest nemesis. Arlene Foster's profile rose as the DUP propped up Theresa May's government through the Confidence and Supply Agreement. When Boris Johnson promised to protect the union, she championed him. He is a fabulous friend to the union and a promoter of the union. But when he agreed a Brexit deal, which left Northern Ireland under a different set of rules from the rest of the UK, it was damaging to the party and Arlene Foster's leadership. Now, the anger among loyalist communities over Brexit has raised the stakes. There is a sense that unionism in Northern Ireland is weakened and losing ground to nationalists. And now Arlene Foster is paying the price. Well, we're into uncharted territory now, as the DUP has never really had a leadership contest in the past. It's always been more of a coronation. And one of the big questions in people's minds now is, will the new leader take the party into an even more hardened position against those Brexit arrangements, the Northern Ireland Protocol? If so, it could place even more strain on the difficult relationship between the UK and the EU and make that critical relationship between unionists and nationalists here even more fragile. Emma, thank you very much. Now, Northern Ireland's First Minister, Arlene Foster, says she'll be stepping down from the job and as leader of the Democratic Unionist Party after a revolt from within her own party ranks, especially over her handling of Brexit. Porrick O'Brien reports now from Belfast. Today, the Great Hall Stormont, emptied by the pandemic, echoing with nothing but history, waiting to see whether Arlene Foster, one of the great fighters in the bear pit of politics here, would survive a coup. Then the answer, no. A short time ago, I called my party chairman to inform him that I intend to step down as leader of the Democratic Unionist Party on the 28th of May and as the First Minister of Northern Ireland at the end of June. I'm well. Her leadership lurched from reconciliation to controversy to crisis Yesterday emerged that over three quarters of Democratic Unionist Party representatives wanted her out. There was no coming back. She became leader of the party in 2015, appointed First Minister of Northern Ireland shortly after. 
the first woman and the youngest person to hold both jobs. My election as leader of the Democratic Unionist Party broke a glass ceiling and I am glad that I have inspired other women to enter politics and spurred them on to getting involved in elected office. And I understand the misogynistic criticisms that female public figures have had to take and sadly it's the same for all women in public life. The seeds of her demise germinating for years, the collapse of Stormont in 2017 for example, came into full bloom though after the DUP supported Brexit and then the Northern Irish Protocol and a trade border down the Irish Sea. Boris Johnson had promised it wouldn't happen, but then as far as the DUP saw it, left them standing at the altar and set the bridal gown alight. Of course, as with highs, there were lows along the way. The three years without devolution caused untold harm to our public services, and the RHI inquiry was a difficult period. The protocol being foisted upon Northern Ireland against the will of unionists has served to destabilise Northern Ireland in more recent times. Arlene Foster has until now walked the thinnest of tightropes, trying to appeal to a more moderate unionist electorate while keeping the religious, socially conservative wing of her party on board. It was issues around gay conversion therapy and abortion that sparked this particular revolt. The big question now is who will take her place? Will it represent a coup for the DUP's hard line? And if it does, what will it mean for the big prize electorally in Northern Irish politics? Will it alienate the moderate middle ground? Arlene Foster's resignation and who takes over is about far more than the DUP. It's about Northern Ireland, yes, but it's also about the very future of the United Kingdom as we know it. Well, joining me now is the political editor of the Belfast newsletter, Sam McBride, who wrote a book about the so-called Cash for Ash scandal, which brought calls for Arlene Foster's resignation back in 2016. Was it the Cash for Ash scandal? Was it her abstention on the gay conversion therapy vote? Or was it the fallout from Brexit, which her own party voted for, which led to Arlene Foster's demise, do you think? It was all of those things, Cathy, and more. Um, Arlene Foster's leadership has been falling apart for four years, really. It's an extraordinary story of someone who has survived despite all of the conventional wisdom in politics saying that she really should not have survived for anything like this long. And really, circumstances are so influential in, in, in how politics unfolds. She had an extraordinary fall from grace at the start of 2017. The, the, uh, the Stormont Assembly collapsed, devolution collapsed. There was an election in which, for the first time in the history of Northern Ireland, unionism under Arlene Foster's leadership lost its majority in Stormont. That was a seismic, a psychological blow to unionism um, and something from which it has not really recovered. And yet within a few months, Theresa May calls a general election. Suddenly the DUP finds itself doing very well in that election in Northern Ireland. And more than that, of course, having the balance of power in Westminster. Once that happened, you can't really sack your leader. You're incredibly successful. And so from then on, she has limped along, mortally wounded, but um, really surviving because her opponents internally couldn't agree and um, couldn't coalesce on an alternative to her. Well, where does all this leave the union and unionism? Because if, if backing Brexit weakened the union, isn't there a danger that if she succeeded by someone much more hard line, that that also will have the same effect? It, it, it is certainly a risk here. I think that what will be keeping people in the DUP up at night at the moment is not just the personality of who takes over, but what their policy is going to be. And um, that might sound like a cliche, but it's not because the DUP has never had in its 50 years of history in Northern Ireland, it's never had an open leadership contest. Every time it has um, just anointed somebody in back rooms, somebody has been tapped on the shoulder, people have gathered signatures. And um, this is potentially the first time that they openly address are we the old Paisleyite party that we once were in the 1970s? Or are we wanting to move into the centre ground really decisively and give a mandate to the leader for that? Arlene Foster never had that sort of clear mandate. She assumed the leadership um, by being given it, really. It was thrust upon her. She accepted it. Um, but she didn't really clearly set out a stall as to what she was going to do with it. The next leader has to do that and potentially has to lead unionism into a border poll.
Well, it's in, well, I'll come back to that in a minute, that final point you make. But when you were asking about who the unionists are now, um, I mean, it's interesting looking at what the Deputy First Minister, Michelle O'Neill, said today, that she noted that Northern Ireland is now quote, a more modern and progressive society, impatient for social reform. Are there any potential leaders of the DUP who are ready to hear that call for reform and reach out to the nationalists? Yes, um, I think that actually one of the interesting things here is that there is a long history in unionism of unionist leaders not being elected on a um, socially liberal or a constitutionally liberal uh, uh, mandate. But once they're in post, sometimes those people turn out to be very surprising. David Trimble was elected as a real hardliner, a right winger, somebody who had um, marched down the road at Drum Cree with Ian Paisley with his arm in the air. He turned out to be the most moderate, if you like, of recent unionist leaders, the man who won the Nobel Peace Prize for negotiating the Good Friday Agreement and really sacrificed his career for that. So I think there's the potential that while Edwin Putz, who is the most likely successor, certainly as first minister, if they don't split the leadership into two separate roles, um, he is the person who's most likely to take over instalment. And while he's caricatured and he's perceived as very much of the old Paisley IDUP, very right wing, a creationist, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. He can also be deeply pragmatic. Very briefly, you talked about a border poll. Next month is the centenary of Northern Ireland's creation. What has Arlene Foster's leadership hastened uh, a united Ireland, do you think? I think it has. I think that's unquestionable when you look at the polling and you look at all of the available evidence. However, Irish unity is not round the corner. If it was, things would be much simpler. We're in a no man's land. It's not clear what's happening. And so therefore, it's all to play for. And that makes it particularly interesting right now. Sam McBride, thanks very much. Now to another political leader who has found herself under pressure lately, but Arlene Foster, Northern Ireland's First Minister, felt she was left with no option but to resign. She will step down as leader of her Democratic Unionist Party at the end of next month and as First Minister at the end of June. She was losing support amongst the DUP over a number of issues, to be fair. Notably, though, the consequences for Northern Ireland of the Brexit trade deal. Ireland is our leader. These were the good times. Under Arlene Foster, the DUP propped up a UK government and she was the most powerful woman in Northern Ireland's 100-year history. But it didn't last. After bringing down Theresa May, Arlene Foster lost that influence and today she admitted she has lost the confidence of her own party. A short time ago, I called my party chairman to inform him that I intend to step down as leader of the Democratic Unionist Party on the 28th of May and as the First Minister of Northern Ireland at the end of June. It is important to give space over the next few weeks to the party officers to allow them to make arrangements for the election of a new leader. Arlene Foster has been forced out by her own side, perceived as too soft on religious and constitutional issues. But the writing was on the wall when an effective border split Northern Ireland from the rest of the UK after Brexit. That protocol was partly behind the fury on the streets this month and since then the writing has been on the wall for the DUP leader. She was toppled by an open revolt and now change is coming, but what kind? There's no place for, for the next leader of the DUP to go other than to take a hard line on the Brexit protocol because that, that's unwaveringly where the majority of unionism is at on this issue. But harder lines make it harder for compromise with Sinn Féin and yet these two opposing parties must find a way to continue sharing power in Northern Ireland. Are you concerned that the next leader of the DUP is going to be harder to work with? We want whoever comes forward to work with all political parties, try to find a way to make politics work. The Good Friday Agreement is here to stay. The political institutions of the Good Friday Agreement are here to stay. There is no alternative. We must work together and deliver for all people. Arlene Foster's time has been turbulent. She had the ear of two prime ministers and took her party into corridors of power that her predecessors could never have dreamed of. But it was all too brief, her critics say an opportunity squandered. Because instead of securing the union, Arlene Foster leaves with Northern Ireland more separate from the UK than ever before.
this should be a big and proud year for the DUP, marking the centenary of Northern Ireland's foundation. Northern Ireland is in many ways the embodiment of unionism and the United Kingdom's role in the island of Ireland. But while Arlene Foster leaves the DUP, yes, in power at Stormont, many of her critics say she's leaving unionism here at a crossroads, if not yet a crisis. And the direction the next leader of the, D D D the DUP takes will have implications not just for Northern Ireland, but for the whole of the United Kingdom. OK, Peter, thank you very much indeed. Arlene Foster, doughty Dwayne of the DUP, First Minister of Northern Ireland, has been forced out of her job by her own party. She seemed at times an indomitable figure, held the balance of power at Westminster during those crucial Brexit negotiation years. Ultimately, though, ironically perhaps, it was the resulting Northern Ireland protocol that partly made her position untenable. She lost her party over tensions that grew up in the country as a result of what became a board and down the Irish Sea, as well as her position on gay conversion therapy and abortion, which some in her party felt not hardline enough. So who takes her place? What direction will the party go in now? And what effect will all this have on one of the most politically fragile parts of the UK right now? Here's Nick Watt. A short time ago, I called my party chairman to inform him that I intend to step down as leader of the Democratic Unionist Party. A sombre end to the trailblazing career of the first woman to have a leadership role in the new Northern Ireland. It has been the privilege of my life to serve the people of Northern Ireland as their first minister. This was hardly a surprise. Trouble had been brewing. There was unease with Arlene Foster as opposition to the Brexit deal amongst loyalists spread to the streets. She was blamed for failing to stand up to Boris Johnson when he agreed to checks. He is a fabulous friend to the union and a promoter of the union. Between Great Britain and Northern Ireland as the price with the EU for avoiding a hard border on the island of Ireland. A first minister implementing something she opposes went the cry from unionist critics. I think that Arlene Foster had become somebody who was something of a hate figure for sections of loyalism. She was seen as too close to Sinn Féin, too cosy with Sinn Féin, somebody who had failed in her central ideological responsibility, as the DUP would see it, that is protecting the union and um, stopping Northern Ireland being cut off from the rest of the UK. And in the 50th anniversary year of the foundation of the DUP by the Reverend Ian Paisley, the firebrand preacher and deep social conservative, Arlene Foster recently found herself out on a limb. She abstained in a vote calling for a ban on gay conversion therapy. That was the final straw after a majority of DUP assembly members voted against the motion. Sinn Féin's Deputy First Minister, who shares power with Arlene Foster in an uneasy cross-community alliance, expressed some sympathy. You sad to see Arlene Foster go? Well, I mean, in, in political leadership, you know, um, it's always very difficult when something like this happens. So, you know, I, I'm mindful of herself and her own personal feelings and her family's feelings today. A leading journalist who has chronicled Arlene Foster's career says her departure tells a wider story about her party. There is a pretty widespread sense across a lot of unionism that the DUP has lost its way. It's forgotten about its roots. It's forgotten about what it really stands for. Brexit has been really fundamental to the unraveling of Arlene Foster's authority within the DUP. Um, she is someone who um, backed Brexit quite late on. There are people who suggest she was not as enthusiastic about it as some of her party colleagues. Um, there was a sense that the DUP under Arlene Foster were really swaggering. They were not seeking to persuade people. They were seeking to use their raw political power at their disposal. The departure of Arlene Foster marks a seminal moment for Northern Ireland, where the political settlement lies in an acutely fragile condition. Unionists are as one in agreeing that the Brexit deal jeopardises their place within the union. But today, divisions blew into the open within the largest unionist party, which may now turn to a new leader less inclined to support the power-sharing executive at the heart of the Good Friday Agreement. A timeless reminder that historic enmities require walls of protection two decades on from Northern Ireland's historic political settlement. And 
tensions which see peace walls rise high above divided communities are being fueled once again as Northern Ireland faces an uncertain future. Nick Watt there will join us now. Naomi Long, the Minister of Justice in the Northern Ireland Assembly, the leader of the Alliance Party, long considered a bridge builder between the DUP and Sinn Féin factions. Nelson McCausland, former DUP Assembly member, and Professor Peter Sherlow, Director of the Institute for Irish Studies at the University of Liverpool. It's good to have you all, Naomi, if I can start with you, because it did all come rather quickly today. And as Nick was saying, Northern Ireland feels quite a politically fragile place right now. I wonder if you think this will calm things down or heat things up? Well, Emily, I think that Northern Ireland has felt like quite a fragile place now for some time. and mm. um, We have only had the restoration um, of devolution for the last 13, 14 months, um, and it has been quite tense throughout that period. This was a, a marriage kind of forged under huge pressure from the public generally, um, and also politically for us to return into government, and it was always going to be a very uncomfortable marriage. Um, with Arlene and Michelle at the helm. And so I think we've all experienced that as members of the executive. It hasn't been quick in terms of coming um, and it hasn't been a surprise in the sense that for quite some time now, um, Arlene's own colleagues um, have been primarily the people who have undermined her authority. Um, we've worked together in the executive. I don't always agree with Arlene. In fact, it would be fair to say I often disagree with her. But nevertheless, I recognise that she had an incredibly difficult job to do. Um, and that she was very passionate in her pursuit of trying to do that job with a degree of integrity. Um, and I think, unfortunately, when she made the necessary compromises, and they are necessary compromises in order to be able to allow us to deal with crises such as the, the pandemic that we're all facing, mm. she was often immediately, almost immediately undermined by her own party colleagues, okay. not by the colleagues outside uh, and not by the general public, uh, but by her own colleagues who then came out and criticised her approach. Let me throw that one straight to, to you, Nelson McCausland. Uh, do you accept that it was your own party, her own colleagues, that undermined her position? Arlene took over the leadership of the, the DUP about five years ago. And within a year, the, the DUP had a, a difficult election. It emerged with 28 seats, just one ahead of uh, Sinn Féin. And in the three years after that, of course, we know that the Assembly was collapsed, devolution was collapsed by Sinn Féin. And a whole series of issues have come together, I think, to create this situation. It's regrettable because I, I think that Arlene's a very able and uh, capable and affable person. Um, who has given many years of service. And we remember that she came from a background where her father was shot by the provisional IRA. Uh, her, her family were put out of their home effectively by the IRA. And even when she was a schoolgirl going to school, the bus she was going to school on with the children, uh, it was blown up by the provisional a, IRA. So it's very difficult stuff. for people. But I just want to bring you up to, to the present because it was a very recent vote, um, her refusal to vote in favour of gay conversion. She abstained on that. Am I right in thinking that you and others found that position too weak, not hardline enough? Well, I think that, first of all, uh, everyone's very clear within the DUP that there is a concern that legislation might be introduced, which is not about some quack therapy or other, but is about effectively preventing and interfering with uh, the, the preaching of the gospel and the, and the practice of prayer. And in fact, on the day of the vote, uh, there was an article, a large article in the morning newspaper uh, from the moderator of the largest Protestant church in Northern Ireland, the Presbyterian Church, um, expressing concerns about these issues. So it's a matter of real concern. It needs to be handled very carefully. And I think that, in a sense, what happened last week was simply the, the thing that brought it all out into the open when yeah. so many MLS rebelled, because there are a whole series of issues over the past few years that okay. have been very, let, let very difficult to handle. Let me just bring in Peter Sherlow, if I can, because I think um, gay conversion therapy is something that will horrify a lot of our viewers. But when you hear it from Nelson's perspective, he says it will lose party members. Uh, just, just give us your crystal ball on this one, Peter. Which way is this going and what concerns you? Well, what concerns me is that this is another unionist leader who's potentially tried to square the circle in terms of modernising unionism. 
Uh, we've had Jamie Trimble, her predecessor, Peter Robinson, Mike Nesbitt, the also Unionist Party. <clears throat> and these are people who know very clearly that the unionist community has changed dramatically over the last 20 years. Massive growth in sector sectorism within the, the, the unionist community. The community in Northern Ireland, which is actually most supportive of marriage equality, which is most supportive of inter-community engagement, such as uh, uh, shared education and also you know, relationships across the sectarian divide, are non-voting Protestants, and in particular, young Protestants who are, who are supportive of the union, but who are increasingly looking at this type of politics and trying to understand where it is going. And if the DUP... Oh, and better... who is that vote? Just just sort of spell it out for us. So when you're looking at, at young um, Protestants, who, who, who are you talking about that vote going to? Well, well, increasingly, in, in, in the, between 2017 and 2019, the two Westminster elections, it went to the Alliance Party, Naomi's party, uh, in terms of the people who voted for them in 2019 who hadn't voted for them before. 20% of their new voters came directly from the DUP. And these are people who support marriage equality. These are people who support inter-community yeah. engagement. So and these are people who support a pluralist and modern Northern Irish society. OK, so from an electoral perspective, Naomi, you could stand to gain from the DUP moving uh, more to the right, more hardline. But from a, a wider question of peace and stability, you could risk seeing Stormont collapse again if, if they chose to walk out? Well, I think the bottom line is that we go to the electorate based on our, um, our principles and our vision and our values. We don't rely on the demise of other parties um, in order to succeed. We've got to provide them with a positive vision. And so it's not about bashing other parties. It's about setting out the progressive kind of policies that Alliance has in terms of how we want to see Northern Ireland work. Um, I want to see Northern Ireland and the Assembly function. I think we need to be honest. I mean, what we have here is a direct conflict between the base that the party was built on. The DUP was built on a free Presbyterian kind of fundamentalist um, religion, religious base. Um, and that translated into also quite fundamentalist unionist politics. But also, it hasn't moved, if you like, to take in the changes that Pete has been talking about in terms of the development of more secular unionism, people who still feel very comfortable being part of the union, but want to be able to access the same um, rights um, as the rest of other people in the UK. Nelson, um, you're, you're, you're losing your party. But who find themselves alienated you know, uh, from I that. Think, Let me just bring in Nelson I to think respond that to that. No, I, I think that there is certainly a need for modernization within unionism. Um, but that is not about changing your core principles or your core message. How you present that message, how you organize as a party, the way that you present that and uh, work with those, all those things but are. Honestly, open there's for no way of presenting gay conversion therapy to make it something message. else, is there? I mean, sorry, there's no way of presenting well, sorry, the legalization I, I, of, of abortion or, or gay conversion therapy sorry, to make it if something I could, else. If, if I could. And I, I said earlier that any sort of quack therapy that people might talk about is quite clearly rejected by everyone. There's no one who's in the business of defending that. What is important is to ensure that a basic human right, this is a human rights issue, the right of religious practice, the right to manifest your religion, that that is protected. So that the rights of everyone but are protected. Not, but what I'm saying is that there's a lot of work to be... Uh, uh, could I just say, finish what I was saying there? Uh, sorry, that's, uh, if I could just finish my point. That is why there was concern expressed by people from religious denominations that are not okay. particularly fundamentalist. In fact, the, the moderator of the Presbyterian Church is the moderator of a denomination to which uh, Naomi Long was previously a member. Peter, let me, let, let me ask you to, to explain how this one is resolved. In terms of, of what, sorry? Well, you just heard that, that Naomi says, you know, this is about human rights and, and Peter is telling us it's about religious rights. And in a sense, those two conflict in terms of, of what the party does and, and where it stands. Well, I think it's very no, simple. Conversion, conversion therapy is not a therapy. And, and I think yet again, it speaks to what I said previously, is that uh, if, if you want to look at where the pro-union unionist community is going and has gone over the last 20, 20 years, the biggest change in our society in terms of the last two censuses, has been the growth in people who do not state their religion. The biggest growth and change in our society has been rapid social liberalisation. If you want to adopt and support a traditional type unionism, you're effectively trying to sell somebody a black and white television in the modern era. 
the, 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 this, the, you look at the data, look at where people have gone, as I stated previously, to the Alliance Party, Green parties, other, other sort of independent uh, left-wing parties. There's a drift in unionism, which, which, which is to other parties, but there's also the biggest share of people who don't vote in Northern Ireland are people who support the union. Okay. Let, let me bring in Naomi, because I, I apologise. I cut you off, Naomi. But, but the, that bigger question, which is where power sharing goes now, which is so critical um, to Stormont to Northern Ireland, is what? Well, I mean, the answer is that power sharing is the only way forward in terms of Northern Ireland. The Good Friday Agreement um, is, is part of, of how we actually move forward together as a community and build for our future. And so whoever, I mean, let's be clear, Ireland is being scapegoated um, for a number of policy issues that have been raised here in terms of the outturn of Brexit, the support for Boris Johnston and the fact that he let them down. They're not the only people he has let down, but they, he, the fact that people feel very aggrieved that he let them down, made promises he didn't keep. Um, all of these things are not simply about Arlene Foster. To be fair to her, she had the full backing of her party and her MPs uh, when it came to, to that policy, the policy decisions that they okay. made. So Arlene Foster going doesn't actually change anything. Okay. The fundamental question that Pete Sherlow has outlined in terms of the dichotomy within unionism, where there are those um, who want to engage on a cross-community basis, who want progressive policies, who want a free and liberal society, and those who are still tied to a very fundamentalist right. and religious speech. Well, is I'm, a conflict with this. I have to say... We're, that we're out of time. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, well, I don't that there's a conflict between religion um, and freedom, because actually freedom of religion is fundamental to any stable society. Understood. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you.